Uh, welcome everyone to the Kalosha webinar on the use of elastomeric respirators in healthcare settings. As the COVID-19 pandemic in California and the entire world continues, many healthcare facilities and individual providers are considering using reusable elastomeric respirators as a more reliable, more economic, and more sustainable means of respiratory protection for workers. Um, these reusable respirators are called elastomeric respirators because they are made of a stretchy, rubbery material. Um, if you see my arrow, this, the material in contact with the face is kind of a rubbery, stretchy material that is given its name, elastomeric. Okay, for the presenters, myself, I am Eric Berg, Deputy Chief of Health for Cal OSHA. Uh, I've been working for Cal OSHA for over 23 years. Next is Dr. Lisa Brosseau, who has recently retired from academia with research and policy expertise in respiratory protection, focused on performance and use of respiratory protection for infectious disease exposures in healthcare settings. She consults with a range of organizations on respiratory protection and infectious aerosol exposures. Dr. Stella Hines, Associate Professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore. She is an occupational medicine physician and pulmonologist. Dr. Hines studies reusable respiratory use in healthcare to address N95 shortages and has published and presented on this topic at national and international meetings. Mark Catlin has almost 40 years experience in industrial hygiene and currently consults for healthcare and other organizations. Since 1992, he has been involved in protecting workers from exposures to infectious diseases, including the use of a reusable elastomeric respirators in the healthcare sector. We're doing this webinar because respirators are necessary to protect workers in healthcare facilities from COVID-19. We want to provide information to healthcare facilities on a viable and practical option for worker protection in lieu of disposable respirators. Uh, elastomeric respirators can be used in place of disposable respirators. Um, elastomeric respirators have been used in healthcare settings successfully for years. Although FDA approval is not needed for elastomerics, um, what is needed is NIOSH approval of these respirators. Um, but FDA issued an emergency use authorization for elastomerics in healthcare settings to protect health healthcare workers from COVID-19 on March 28, 2020. Since they are disposable and not reusable, N95 filtering face piece respirators can present supply chain challenges to facilities. Elastomerics present much less of a supply chain challenge than disposables, since the respirators and their filters can be reused many times and for long periods of time. Um, since elastomerics are reusable and do not need to be continually replaced, they are much more economical than disposals. Elastomerics provide superior alternative to N95 filtering face respirators as they provide a more stable fit and a better seal to the face due to the materials of their construction. A little background on the use of respirators to protect workers in healthcare and other settings from aerosol transmissible diseases. California has a specific regulation to protect workers from aerosol transmissible diseases. It is Title VIII, Section 5199, or also commonly referred to as the ATD standard, the aerosol transmissible disease standard. This regulation covers healthcare plus many other types of facilities and services. On this list of all the um, services and facilities covered, uh, one through nine on this list are different healthcare services and facilities. Uh, and then items 10 through eight show facilities and services outside of healthcare that are also covered. As you can see, the ATD standard is much broader than just healthcare, but it definitely covers healthcare. Under the ATD standard, uh, COVID-19 is an airborne infectious disease. 
respiratory protection is required for any and all occupational exposure to COVID-19. And the last thing is um, different types of respirator called powered air purifying respirators equal or greater protection is generally required for aerosol generating procedures. And one topic I wanna cover on initially because it is such a uh, controversial issue is source control and elastomeric respirators. Escalation valves on elastomeric respirators are expected to provide similar source control to a surgical mask or a cloth face covering that are generally required now for the public. Um, for surgical masks and cloth face coverings, when a person exhales, their exhalation escapes through the sides of the mask or the face covering because these types of devices do not seal to the face. Exhalation valves on elastomeric respirators work similarly. When a person exhales, the exhalation does not escape unimpeded. It strikes the valve and other materials around the valve, which opens and allows the exhalation to escape in a perpendicular direction to the exhalation. In addition, in many elastomerics, the exhalation valve leads to a secondary chamber, which contains and then redirects exhalation vertically downward. Some of the droplets and droplet nuclei adhere to the surface of the valve and secondary chain chamber on impaction, which provides the source control similar to surgical masks and face covering. If additional source control is required, face shields with drapes or surgical mask over the exhalation valve can be used. And I have some pictures showing it. On the left here is a face shield with a drape. The drape can be inserted into the shirt of the user to provide source control while uh, elastomeric respirators used underneath. And on the right, we have a picture of a, a standard half mask elastomeric respirator. And this part right here where it says 3M is the secondary chamber. The exhalation valve exit into this chamber and the exhalation comes out where this arrow is showing. Um, and so you can cover that part with a surgical mask as shown in this picture. Um, and that is allowed by Cal OSHA and NIOSH to cover this. Um, it should not be tight, it should be loose fitting. And this is not allowed, however, for filtering face piece respirators or N95s. You cannot use a surgical mask over an N95 respirator. Uh, only an elastomeric respirator shown here. And next up, I want to introduce Dr. Lisa Brosseau, who will be continuing the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is Lisa Brosseau. I uh, thank you for uh, to Cal California OSHA for the opportunity to speak with you today about elastomeric respirators. Um, in the case of a novel infectious organism, the precautionary approach suggests that we should not rule out any mode of transmission. The first three here that I listed, contact droplet and airborne, are part of the traditional infection control paradigm. Uh, contact, of course, involves transfer from a contaminated surface to your mouth, nose, or eyes. CDC says this is a relatively unimportant mode for COVID-19, but it shouldn't be ruled out. Droplet transmission involves the propulsion of particles into the nose, mouth, or the eyes. This is the only particle transmission mode that's being given any attention for COVID-19, but it involves uh, being very close to someone who is symptomatic, sneezing or coughing, and it, it does not involve inhalation. Airborne is defined as inhalation of infectious particles, but it's thought to occur only very far away from an infectious source, and it's not being given a lot of attention uh, for COVID-19, although I think it should be. Uh, they, one a piece of the puzzle that is not being um, recognized, I think, is that there is the potential for inhaling aerosols, uh, aerosols of small particles near the source of, uh, meaning near someone who is infectious. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. So here's the classic and now outdated disease transmission paradigm. Somebody coughs or sneezes, they generate droplets, which are considered to be very large, which could be propelled onto the face of the mucous membrane, somebody standing 
close by, uh, and the you know the distances vary depending on who your whose guidelines you're reading. And then the other piece of the, the puzzle for particles is airborne transmission, but that has to occur over long distances, far range, and the you know the distances vary depending on who your whose guidelines you're reading. And then the other piece of the, the puzzle for particles is airborne transmission, but that has to occur over long distances, far range, where the droplet nuclei, the uh, evaporated particles, are, occur only far from a source. And traditionally, we those are divided up as greater and less than five microns. As, um, I'm going to just briefly show a couple of slides that demonstrate what really happens. This traditional classic infection control paradigm is really uh, quite out of date by more than 70 years and does not reflect our current understanding of the creation, behavior, or assimilation of aerosols. Um, Dr. Rachel Jones, the University of Utah, and I worked with Absolute Science Illustration to describe in relatively simple terms what happens over time after an aerosol is generated by a cough or a sneeze, or coughing or breathing. When such an aerosol is generated, it contains a range of particle sizes, actually, both large and small, not just large. So someone standing nearby may experience that droplet spray, but they may also be surrounded by many small particles that are inhalable. That's what this illustration shows. Most of the particles in this aerosol will not fall immediately to the ground. The larger ones can remain suspended for several minutes, the smaller ones for many minutes and hours. Evaporation will occur, which decreases the overall size distribution of the aerosol. With time, some of those larger particles will settle and the smaller ones will continue to disperse. The person close to the source, um, person B, will continue to be exposed to these inhalable smaller particles. And if the virus, virus remains viable in air and the dose received elicits infection, then dose then a disease could commence. As you can see, the person further from the source does not have exposure at this point. But with more time, as you get more dispersion of smaller particles and more deposition of larger ones, um, you, that person at point C will be exposed to um, inhalable particles. And this can occur within a room. So this is not just, uh, this is not airborne necessarily transmission. This is aerosol transmission. Um, the, I should note that these conditions we're showing are what happens in still air. If you added air currents, you might get more and more uh, quicker dispersion of all those particles throughout the room. Uh, we're showing here that these smaller particles have been dispersed now into that area for person C, well, although they still exist uh, for person B as well. So I would suggest we think about um, the infection control paradigm somewhat differently, where we should consider um, adding aerosol transmission, meaning inhalation of small particles at close range, in addition to propulsion of large particles or droplet transmission that occur at close range. I also want to note that an organism that's capable of airborne transmission, like tuberculosis and measles, is also uh, capable of aerosol transmis transmission because uh, it depends on how long that our organism is able to stay alive in the air. And if it's alive at a long distance, it's certainly alive at the nearby location. Um, it's always important to note when we talk about respiratory protection that um, it's at the bottom of the hierarchy of controls and that we should expect and, and um, OSHA expects that respirators are only used after source and pathway control, such as the ones listed here have been implemented. But let's talk about respirators in the context of SARS-CoV-2 in healthcare. And obviously these are needed in a play, in a, during a pandemic in healthcare settings in particular, because SARS-CoV-2 is an aerosol transmissible high-risk virus with a high probability for pre- and asymptomatic transmission. I don't have time to go into all the uh, evidence that that supports the um, SARS-CoV-2 as an aerosol transmissible disease, but there is plenty. And there is potential exposure to infectious aerosols when you're in close proximity to patients or when you've been spending, uh, when you spend time, when you are enter a space in which a patient has been 
uh, infectious for some period of time. So we're going to talk about, or Eric has already mentioned, um, negative pressure air purifying respirators. These are the most commonly used in, in healthcare settings. So N95 filtering face beads, of course, being the most common, which is considered disposable, has an assigned protection factor of 10, which means it reduces the inside concentration by 10 fold in comparison to the outside con concentration. Um, the reason we're talking about half masks with re replaceable N95 cartridges or elastomeric respirators, which come in full face piece as, um, configurations as well, is because they are con continuously reusable, meaning that is how they are designed. Um, and as, I, as I've noted here, um, if you quantitatively fit test a full face piece, you actually end up with something that has a higher concentrate, a higher assigned protection factor of 50. So filtering face piece respirators, um, while well accepted, um, do have some serious uh, disadvantages in the context of the pandemic. And I've listed a few of these here. Obviously, their supplies are not unlimited. We've had supply issues from the beginning, which occurred during the novel H1N1 pandemic as well. Uh, you can reuse them and the extended use is possible, but there are problems associated with those. They're designed to be worn several times and then discarded. They're not designed to be cleaned or disinfected, and they do not fit well after five to ten donnings. And actually, uh, NIOSH says you should not uh, redon a respirator, this type of respirator, more than five times because they start to fail in terms of their fit. On the other hand, elastomeric respirators. While initially more expensive, will save a huge amount of money over time because you do not need to buy uh, this, the uh, face piece any longer. You might need to buy a few of the components, the valves, eventually the straps, maybe, and certainly the filter cartridges. But they're easy to clean and maintain. In fact, that's how they've been designed, and they're well established uh, cleaning and decontamination and disinfection um, protocols for elastomeric respirators. They're quite easy to seal check, easier than a filtering face piece respirator, and they do uh, more consistently fit each time you don them uh, because of their design. The full face piece design offers eye protection and a higher overall protection and factors, as I, as I noted. And if we had been able to give every healthcare worker caring for patients during this pandemic an elastomeric respirator, Imagine how many supplies would be available for all the other healthcare workers and essential workers who need them. Um, Eric mentioned this question about exhalation valves. Unfortunately, there are no data yet, but NIOSH and others are working on um, evaluating the actual particle count and, and size that it, uh, are emitted from exhalation valves. But this picture should show you what he was talking about. There's a valve seat, there's a valve itself, and there's a valve cover. So particles uh, don't just exit through a hole. They have to make their way through a, a number of components. So it's, and I'm showing in comparison where you get air leakage all the way around surgical masks and face coverings, including behind the head. So there's no way that these are equivalent in terms of emission. Some important issues, and I know there have been questions about these, so I want to cover them briefly. Filter cartridge uh, lasts, the filters themselves last quite a long time <clears throat> because the low, there are low particle concentrations in healthcare settings. Um, but they should probably be changed at least annually, and you can uh, certainly change them out when breathing resistance increases. They basically just load with particles to the point where they're difficult to breathe through. Um, I've had, heard complaints about uh, communication. Well, that, that's true with any kind of respirator. But elastomeric respirators do come, some models do come with speaking diaphragms. And there are certainly, uh, with SARS-CoV-2, concerns about eye protection and eye, um, ocular transmission. You can wear half, half mask respirators with face shields or goggles or safety glasses. Um, and full face piece respirators obviously provide eye protection. In the context of eye protection, I wanted to, I want to stress that face shields do not offer any respiratory protection. Um, they really should be worn only in combination with the respirator to prevent inhalation of infectious particles. This describes a study that was done by NIOSH showing that uh, you get uh, it, uh, the 
face shield prevents the um, droplet transmission that's not uh, aerosol or airborne transmission. And briefly, I'll mention, of course, these powered air surfing respirators, although not the subject of today's talk, um, where you, uh, these are the probably the two most common with seating face piece and hood use, hood you know, configurations used in healthcare settings. And certainly these should be used where aerosols are being generated during medical procedures. They so have some important advantages over negative pressure respirators, less work of breathing, greater comfort, higher protection. There are some disadvantages too with uh, battery charging and more components to clean. And I would note a, a recent study demonstrated they do not contribute to particles in the external environment. And with that, I'm going to turn this talk over to Dr. Hines, who will discuss her experience with elastomeric respirators. Thank you very much, Dr. Brousseau. Well, thank you for listening in today. Um, as um, you heard before, I'm Stella Hines. I am a pulmonologist and occupational medicine physician at the University of Maryland School of Medicine here in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, what I hope today is that um, I'm able to share some of the knowledge we have gained from our experience using elastomeric respirators long before COVID hit, and it will help you be able to implement a successful res respirator program, um, even if it's brand new for you. So a disclaimer that I do have funding for some previous and current research related to respiratory protection from NIOSH and from a respirator manufacturer named Clean Space Technology. And these are my views and not the views of the University of Maryland Medical Center or School of Medicine. So elastomeric respirators have been in use at our University of Maryland Baltimore campus since 2009, when the 2009 H1N1 outbreak caused N95 shortages. And the hospital was not able to acquire N95s at the level of perceived need, and they had to troubleshoot. And the safety director for the hospital was familiar with elastomeric respirators from use in general industry. So these elastomeric respirators were procured and were um, assigned for use for workers both in the hospital and in the ambulatory environments. And um, the decision logic was that workers in the inpatient units where they would be most likely to be caring for patients with influenza-like illness would be the ones to receive these respirators. And so those were the medicine floors, the medical intensive care unit, the ED, pediatrics, and radiology, phlebotomy. Um, now that practice continued long after the 2009 outbreak was over. Um, and ultimately, it was transitioned away from that in kind of the tail end of 2016. And I think a lot of the motivation for the expected transition was we had seen that workers who, despite being assigned to use elastomeric respirators, were using N95s. Um, primarily, we think out of convenience, but I'm going to get into that a little bit. So with kind of some concern about non-compliance with expected use, the program kind of pivoted to more N95 and PAPR based. But even with that transition, about a quarter of elastomeric users spoke up and wanted to remain in that form of respiratory protection um, despite the, the planned move otherwise. So the devices that um, were used were the 3M7500 series elastomeric respirators, which come in small, medium, and large face masks. Um, and they were fitted with these 7093P100 particulate cartridge filters. And so these are covered filter cases so that the, the filter is not openly exposed to the air and with that hard plastic case over it, that becomes cleanable. So about five years after the initial experience with the elastomeric respirators, the hospital had over 5,600 people in the respiratory protection program and over 2,000 were in tight-fitting respirators, the majority of whom 
were elastomeric wearers. So this provided kind of a, a critical opportunity to try to answer some questions about how elastomeric respirators could be used in healthcare. So with funding from NIOSH, starting in 2015 and concluding in 2016, we did a study using key informant interviews and focus groups, but then a large electronic survey of our healthcare worker population to try to answer the question of whether elastomeric respirators are an acceptable and are they a feasible alternative to N95s in healthcare. And our survey included 1,152 total respondents, a combination of N95, elastomeric, and PAPR users, and 432 of them were elastomeric users. So in that study, again, the people were surveyed not during pandemic time, they were surveyed in the fall of 2016. From a user acceptance standpoint, we saw that the elastomeric users scored their highest, scored their respirators highest in sense of protection from disease and in confidence that the respirator would protect them. Yet despite lower comfort and communication ratings, they were lower than what we saw for the N95s, for example, the elastomeric users still said that they would prefer to use that form of respiratory protection in certain high-risk hypothetical scenarios, such as pandemic, influenza, or active TB. So despite those lower ratings on communication, um, which were lower, and mildly decreased ratings on comfort, the elastomeric users still said they would prefer to use that respirator in a high-risk scenario. Now, in terms of logistics, um, we saw some other interesting findings. So we just simply asked the question, is the respirator model and size you were assigned to use available when you need it? And you can see here that most people said yes. You know, 75% said always, 19% said usually. However, then when we say, okay, if it's available when you need it, it's got to be nearby. And when we asked, where is it, where do they store it? And 65% said that it's in a drawer near the patient's room or it's somewhere in the patient care area. But that means that there was 35% giving answers that were not necessarily suggesting that the respirator is in a convenient location, somewhere else on campus, in my car or other. And uh, obviously, if you need something at point of use, you need it to be there and ready and available when you need it. So um, the other thing that we um, saw with this was we tried to evaluate the answers about um, storage location and availability in respirators who were assigned to use elastomeric respirators and they were using them regularly versus people that were non-compliant and were using N95s. And we saw that that inconvenient storage location was more often reported in those non-compliant elastomeric respirator users. Now, the big issue that always comes up relates to decontamination. So at the time of this survey, the expected practice was that after each use, a respirator user should wipe down all the surfaces of the respirator with an alcohol pad or disinfectant wipe. That was the expectation in 2016. And you can see here that only 58% of our respondents said that they always did this. And I think in healthcare, we are similar to hand washing, we are striving for 100%. And on a little bit even more dramatic um, kind of finding, the, the practice in 2009 when these things were rolled out was that the healthcare worker should take off the filters of the respirator and submerge the respirator in soap and water and clean it. And in 2016, when we asked people if they, how often they did that, you can see here that the majority did not did not remove the filters and wash inside the respirator. So 
the um, and again, kind of looking at these decontamination practices, we did not see a difference in reporting of these outcomes between compliant versus non-compliant elastomeric respirator users. So in summary, we saw that user acceptance is not a critical barrier towards elastomeric respirator healthcare use, but that storage and assuring availability were barriers to expected use. And while disinfection was not a barrier to expected use, there was inadequate compliance with the expected cleaning practice when we left it to the individual. And that's how our program was set up at the time. Each individual was assigned to their own respirator. They were expected to keep up with it. They were expected to clean it. And so kind of in terms of that cleaning strategy and disinfection strategy, that can probably be taught with additional education, but strategies to centralize that process would bypass this. So we identified what these potential barriers are from this study. And so now thinking about how do you overcome them? Thinking about that first big issue was that storage and availability. So um, there are different models of how these respirator programs can be carried out. And the idea is you could either use kind of a central cash approach or an individual-based approach. So for example, at the Texas Center for Infectious Disease, which has uh, used elastomeric respirators um, for years to care primarily for tuberculosis patients, the practice there is that each healthcare worker is given a, like a backpack to carry the respirator around. So the, the healthcare worker has no excuse. The respirator is on them. Um, in a pilot program uh, out of WorkSafe BC, um, the, this Canadian study rolled out elastomeric respirators on a trial basis to an ICU. And the plan there was that um, they would be given to the unit and then at the end of the shift, the, all the respirators would go down to their central sterile processing and for cleaning and then returned back to the unit. But in that, in that pilot, um, the, the program failed primarily because staff had not been specifically identified to take the respirators back and forth from the unit to cleaning. And so whose responsibility was it? And then more recently, Allegheny Health out of the Pittsburgh area has published their findings in setting up um, kind of a, a, a similar structure to that Canadian trial where the respirators were rolled out to the units, but with kind of this centralized cleaning and taking kind of transportation back and forth to the units. Um, so I think the, the take home message here is if you are going to use kind of a central cache of respirators, there needs to be staff identified in advance who are going to make sure that these respirators are getting from point to point and that it's their job to do that. And then second, if you are expecting the individuals to kind of hold on to and maintain their respirators, it makes sense to provide a means of readiness, whether it's a backpack or a fanny pack or whatever, but something to assure that that user can keep it on their person. So in terms of cleaning and disinfection, um, there actually has been some work in this space that has provided answers that are helping us now. So just a little bit of background, when we think about cleaning, cleaning is the removal of soiling agents, so dirt. And in this case, we're talking about facial oils, cosmetics, moisturizers that get on face masks whereas disinfection refers to removal of microbial agents. And in this case, of course, we have concern about virus. And so there are strategies that you can do this on an individual basis or on a central basis, but I wanna review some of the strategies that have been published on this. So there are protocols that have been described uh, by Bessesen's paper in the American Journal of Infection Control in 2015, as well as in Lawrence's uh, publication in 2017. And then um, from the same group of applied research associates, their report to the FDA 
from 2019. And basically in all three of these strategies, it's a similar concept where the filters are removed from the face mask and then the surfaces of the respirator face mask harness straps are cleaned using a neutral detergent, which can be as simple as dish soap um, with warm water and a soft brush or sponge. And then the respirator is disinfected. Um, what has been published includes dilute bleach solution. There are other solutions that, uh, excuse me, other chemical disinfectants that are probably fine. They just have not been published. And then the disinfectant is rinsed off. And in the studies that have been published, the time taken to complete this ranged from 16 to 23 minutes, but the drying process take up, took up to about up to six hours. And that limitation seems to be primarily driven by the length of time taken for the straps. So Applied Research Associates also studied an automated reprocessing um, strategy. And with elastomerics, there are upper temperature limits, and um, which is unfortunate. So otherwise you could put it in an autoclave, but here the, the temperatures are too high and will not support that. And so Applied Research Associates studied five different elastomeric models that had been contaminated with influenza, and they put the respirators in a traditional hospital washer disinfector, but set the temperature at a medium temperature at 50 Celsius, 122 Fahrenheit. And normally these machines operate at greater than 90 Celsius. And so in their um, kind of study, we'll see, I'll show you kind of what the evidence of effect was. So for the Lawrence and ARA 2019 studies, in, in all of these protocols, they had contaminated these masks with influenza. And in their manual reprocessing strategy, they showed that virus was eliminated from all surfaces. In their automated um, cleaning and disinfection, they showed no detectable viable virus. And in their study, they compared just cleaning it with the neutral detergent alone versus neutral detergent plus chemical disinfectant. And interestingly, they saw no difference in the end result if you added the disinfection strategy, just kind of interesting there. From a durability standpoint, what they saw was they um, kind of retested the elastomerics for a variety of um, fit um, and other tests that are required of elastomerics. And the respirators passed all of these tests after 150 manual cycles and 100 cycles from the automated process. So, you know, we've talked about a procedure that involves having to use soap and water and having a running water source. It would be a lot easier if you could just disinfect these respirators with a disinfectant wipe and be done with it. So we tested this hypothesis in a study that was published this past spring in the Journal of the International Society for Respiratory Protection. And we studied this on the um, silicone elastomeric face masks of the, um, the clean space halo respirator, which is actually a PAPR, but it's got a face mask similar to an elastomeric. And what we saw here is that from a facial contaminant standpoint, like facial oils, just using the disinfectant wipe did not reliably remove all of the soiling agents. Um, and so I think ultimately you do also have to use a detergent process um, to get the facial oils off and to assure that the viral contaminants are also removed. So what about the cartridges? So in terms of cleaning and disinfection, um, this was also studied by Applied Research Associates and they compared cleaning alone by using kind of a sponge soaked in a neutral detergent compared to cleaning plus disinfection that also included use of a sandy cloth wipe. Again, they demonstrated that it removed all virus and they passed the particle penetration test 
they all passed afterwards and that was after even 150 cycles of decontamination. So the, the filters will still work with repeated cycles of um, wiping. Um, and the kind of guidance that has always been present in the past um, on this is to change the filters if they become wet or damaged. So what are we doing? Um, our current COVID respirator program at the University of Maryland includes elastomeric respirators both in the ambulatory environments and in the hospital. So the ambulatory respiratory protection program is run by the employee health pro uh, program. And elastomerics are the main form of respiratory protection in that environment. And the strategy here is that these are assigned to the individual um, and that the individual practices are expected to clean and maintain the respirators and expected to take them apart, clean them in soap and water, let them dry out at the end of each shift with wiping after each individual use. And these practices are scattered kind of all over the region. And so trying to do that from a centralized location, it didn't make sense to set that up in this environment. And so we have videos that are available to the public on our website, on YouTube, that explain how we are doing this. Um, and again, I think these slides are, and it's in the handout too. Now on the hospital side, the respiratory protection program is run by our safety group. And um, elastomerics are part of our pandemic plan. We are also using PAPRs and also using N95s. And the expectation is that each elastomeric user wipes the respirator on all of the surfaces after each use. And at the end of the shift, the respirators are dropped off in a central PPE distribution center drop-off location where the respirators are taken to central sterile processing and they are manually cleaned and disinfected. And it really is in accordance with that Bessesen protocol, which the Lawrence protocol is really the, similar. Um, the only exception I would say is that we are not using bleach. Um, we had some concern about bleach as a respiratory irritant and are using an Oxivir disinfectant instead. And I think what has been critical to us is that we are using a shared supply, um, which has allowed us, or a pool, which has allowed us to provide the most um, respirators to the people who need them at the time that they need them. And we set this up again through this PPE distribution center run by one of our fantastic trauma nurses who kind of went into this role um, at the onset of COVID. And the respirators are checked out, taken for work, and when at the end of the day, they are checked back in. So in summary, elastomeric respirators have been used in healthcare prior to COVID. Facilities must have plans for assuring storage, availability, cleaning and disinfection, and cleaning and disinfecting protocols do exist and they could be adapted for local use. And I think what we've seen is that elastomeric respirators can alleviate some N95 shortage burden. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to turn the presentation over to Mark Catlin. Well, thank you. I, I really want to thank Dr. Hines for her presentation and also for the incredible generous sharing of the experience um, that that she and her uh, her system has done during this pandemic. My presentation um, uh, will will provide some additional experience from some other healthcare facilities who's also been uh, been uh, happy to talk about their uh, experience with the use of elastomerics and and also then provide some some uh, resources at the end. So my experience with um, elastomerics actually started in the first half of my industrial hygiene career when I was involved with many environmental construction firms as they were learning to use elastomerics and other personal protective gear as they, as they moved into environmental work, asbestos and, and lead abatement and mold and other things. And so that was an industry that had to learn to use an unfamiliar piece of equipment. And so uh, in the last 20 years of my, of my industrial hygiene work, I've been focused mostly in the healthcare 
sector and have done a lot of work since um, 2009 because of the H1N1 experience. I've also been been wondering about the use of these elastomerics in healthcare and and been been uh, a part of trying to help um, healthcare organizations look at this. So during H during uh, since COVID began, I've been talking with a lot of healthcare organizations and. Uh, about the use of this uh, of these devices, and so I want to share some of the experience of some of the uh, systems that are that are happy to talk about their experience with folks. Um, and let me share this information. Okay, so uh, Dr. Heinz mentioned the Texas Center for Infectious Disease in San Antonio, and this is a this is sort of a unique seventy by seventy five bed hospital in uh, uh, public hospital. And uh, they actually have, for more than 20 years, used elastomeric respirators. When hospitals were moving to N95s in the late 90s for tuberculosis, they decided on the virtue of cost that, that elastomerics made a lot more sense when they looked at how much, how much use they would have over time. And so they, they began this as a cost-saving measure. And, but once they started using elastomerics and they saw the, the better respirator, respiratory protection, they saw the ease of use, they uh, they were sold on this as a better uh, respiratory protection device for their staff, and they've not looked back. And they they've certainly been encouraging folks in the in, in the Texas area to switch. And they've been they have been treating COVID patients, so they're not only seeing TB patients. The a, a recent uh, hospital system that Dr. Hines also mentioned, the Allegheny Health Network near Pittsburgh, they adopted elastomerics in the spring, and they're in the they're in the sort of process of, of switching this over throughout their system. So there are nine hospital system with uh, over 2,000 beds and over two, over 20,000 staff. And they switched over because of the supply issues with N95s, as many people are looking at these last emergencies. But they also switched over because they were facing the use of decontaminated respirators and felt that that wasn't a, a choice they wanted to make. Now, they've also put out uh, they recently published this very uh, uh, interesting article on the implementation of their program. And, and so I'd urge people to, to get a copy of this. It's, it can be downloadable off the internet and to see the experience that they've had. And I'll summarize some of that here. And the third hospital system that I think that is, that's, uh, that's had some successful implementation is the University of Colorado Hospital. And they've, they started using uh, in the spring of 2020 with the, with the pandemic, they started using uh, elastomeric respirators. But interestingly enough, their, their emergency manager, um, who was familiar with elastomerics because of his disaster response work, uh, uh, at the end of H1N1, they actually purchased 800 elastomeric respirators for future use, and they've been in a warehouse for uh, for about the last 10 years, and they pulled those out early on in the in this pandemic, and then they purchased um, 4,000 and more respirators since then, and they're switching, uh, and so they're switching their system over into um, into elastomerics also. Now, the, 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 there, are, there are lots of different types of, of, of um, elastomeric of half masks that are available. So the Texas Center for Infectious Disease is using primarily this North, uh, this North brand, and you can see that that is what fits most of their, most of their staff. Uh, they're able to get a, a positive fit test on most staff with, with these three sizes and this North brand respirator. Okay. They also have a Moldex uh, uh, sizes for folks who can't fit on the North, and there's some use of a small use of, of powered air purifying respirators. The University of Colorado Hospital System is, is using the North brand respirators here also. Okay. The Allegheny Health Network is using this, um, this MSA uh, manufacturer advantage uh, half face mask in three sizes. And uh, this came about because the MSA companies headquartered in Pittsburgh, as is Allegheny Health Network, and they 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 had a connection there. And the the first couple hundred, I understand, were donated to the hospital system, and they've been buying thousands more since. The supplies seem to be easing up. There were problems with supplies uh, uh, two months ago, but that seems to not be an issue anymore, from what I'm hearing. Now, ten years ago, the VA the national VA actually purchased a large number of elastomerics. There were some champions at the VA who saw elastomerics after H1N1 as a, as a supply problem solution. And so they purchased this Spirian brand that actually had these covers, sort of an interesting one that had some revision or had some adaption for healthcare use. 
uh, but that's been since discontinued by its uh, manufacturer. So I think there may be some openings as more healthcare systems are interested in these to have manufacturers be interested in making some uh, adaptions to make these more useful in healthcare. <laughs> you can go to the, you can look at the full range of, of NIOSH approved respirators by going to the NIOSH website to this uh, trusted source information. Here's a, here's a URL. And you can sort of look through uh, the, the listing of all the approved respirators and manufacturers. This is just one of five or six pages of these. And so you can get a sense of, of what their options are out there. Um, and as Dr. Hines mentioned, I think as you look at the various options and there are different types of materials that the elastomeric trace masks are made of, and there's different configurations for the filters, um, and and uh, most of these are latex free anymore, which can be an issue. Um, I, you know, I, I think if you have a choice and you can try and you can try your staff to check out several different types and see which one seems to be the preferable one for your folks is a good idea if you have the luxury. Uh, what you do want to try to do is avoid the respirator on the left, on the right, which has what we call pancake filters. And you see, they're not enclosed in the plastic case, and so these are these are a whole different issue to, to disinfect if you're, you're going to do that. So, so the ones on the left are better options. Um, if we look at um, changing over to elastomerics, there's it's actually not a major change if you have an effective respirator program already in place. The medical approval. Uh, system is uh, has to be redone, but it's similar. The fit testing methods are the same, but has to be redone because you're using a new type of respirator. Um, the user seal check, and, and uh, Dr. Berceau mentioned that, the user seal check is much more easy to do and much more reliable and gives you a sense that the mask is on your face and, and protecting you. And that's much difficult, that's much more difficult to do with the N95s. And the filtration um, or the, the assigned protection factor is is listed as the same, but in, in terms of industrial hygiene, there are many of us who feel like the N95s are not as protective with the seal as the elastomerics. And I think the consensus from people who wear them is that these, the elastomerics seal on your face better and, and provide better protection. And there are the N95 filters for elastomerics, but there's also the, the uh, there are N99 and, and 100 rated filters. So there's actually a broader range of filters, which which are which all of which would be uh, useful for um, for this um, pandemic. Okay. I wanted just to show on the bottom here the user seal check for the uh, for the elastomeric. So it's you can use your hands, you can use a glove to cover the exhalation valve and cover the and and uh, and and cover the cartridges. But this is something that can be easily taught. People can demonstrate they know how to do it. And it's a very positive way to know that that when you're using this respirator uh, on the floor, that it's on your face right. Um, and as Dr. Hines had mentioned, they, these are probably these highlighted in red. These are kind of the key issues with um, with, the, with the respirator program that need to be set up addressed with elastomerics. And luckily, there was an article that came out early in the pandemic uh, from um, uh, Dr. Pompey went in Texas on on fit testing and training, uh, trying to see how it would how a switch over with to uh, elastomerics would be. And I think I would recommend you look at this article. And they they found really not a problem with both fit testing and with training. There's a need for for uh, some hands-on training and practice. These are these these uh, elastomeric respirators are a little more complicated. And they do take some time for people to get used to wearing these and be able to check the check the parts and and certainly the cleaning and disinfecting, as Dr. Hines mentioned, is is an important issue. Um, what most facilities have seen is that the fit testing is actually is actually much easier, and that with with one or two tries, most staff can be fit tested to these elastomerics. Um, and once you fit tested, folks, that that uh, fit test, you don't need to be redoing that because you're changing. Um, you're changing models like you do with N95. That fit test is now good for the year. Okay. Um, in terms of, of respirator care and the filters, here's some. Here's the kind of experience from these three facilities. Uh, all of these facilities have the wares do the uh, w uh, disinfecting wipes between patients. So the real issue is is how how do they handle the the deeper cleaning disinfecting at the end of the shift or or, or periodically. 
and and then where do the respirators, how are they stored? And, and the Texas Center for Infectious Disease, which is a smaller facility and actually has a sort of sprawling campus, they, they always used a decentralized system where staff are issued a respirator, it's their uh, piece of equipment for their exclusive use. And then they're trained and they're expected both to clean between patients and then and then do the inspection, deep cleaning, disinfecting at the end of the ship. And they report that this has not been a problem. They do have their respirator expertise within their respiratory therapy program, and that staff is available to both coach, to answer questions, and to do periodic audits to make sure that the system, uh, that, that these things are being done. And they change their filters on an annual basis when they do their annual fit testing. The Allegheny Health Network, uh, as I've talked with them, as they began using this with a small number of respirators, they went to a decentralized system with uh, staff issued respirators for their exclusive use, but they're now, they're now moving to a more centralized system to both uh, allow a greater number of people to use the respirators and to have some more control over the cleaning and disinfecting. Um, and so at this point, the, the wearers return their respirator at the end of the shift uh, and they're, they're transported to central processing that cleans, infects, cleans disinfects and, and inspects them and then returns them. And, they, and that seems to be working. They have, a, they have the system set up so that it actually works. The University of Colorado hospital system is, is, seems to be moving to sort of a hybrid system. They also started with a decentralized system at the beginning, assigning respirators to individual users who then would, would care for these. Uh, but they're now moving to a, a system where uh, staff who are mobile will continue to have their own respirators, but staff that are not mobile, there'll be a centralized, there'll be a centralized uh, system within departments. And so people will get their respirators within the department. They'll, uh, they're expected to clean and disinfect those during the day, return them to the, to the shared use of the department. And then periodically the uh, central, central uh, processing will come and get those and do deeper cleaning and inspection. And, so I think there's a there's a number of models that can work here, and the and uh, the real key is is uh, is to have a system that works and accomplishes the the goals that have to be done. Okay. Um, and this is a, this is what uh, Dr. Hines had mentioned. So this is a little simple backpack that they use at the Texas Center of Infectious Disease, so that the respirators are are always with staff um, as they need them, um, and so that that's something that they're very happy with. Um, I. I think the key to implementation is is really figuring out a system that will work for your facility, and and I think that always involves uh, including your staff, or fresh, and especially your frontline staff. The Allegheny Health Network has had deep involvement of their frontline nurses and and other staff in in this in this uh, implementation phase. Uh, you you might have a program that varies across the facility, so I don't it doesn't have to be a one size fits all. And I think it's really important that there be support for the staff with this new piece of equipment, and that there be uh, also uh, audits from the employer to make sure that the cleaning disinfecting is actually getting done right. And when problems are identified, that those are fixed. Um, so this is the uh, National Academy of Science report that that came out in actually 2019. This was a year-long study. The National Academy of Science has looked at uh, a variety of respirator issues in healthcare for more than a decade and looking at various types of solutions. So this report was pretty timely done and it's available on their website and I would urge folks to get a copy of that. Um, you can see the challenge that they identified, which is the challenge that we're, all, we're really seeing is the issues of cleaning, disinfecting, and storage between use, but, but certainly lots of advantages that we've talked about. There's some other good resources. There's this uh, OSHA, NIOSH, and other uh, hospital respiratory, pro respiratory protection program toolkit. This actually was was adapted from from a similar toolkit that was first designed, first developed by the California Health Department a couple years before this. And so this can be a useful resource for you. And then sort of an organizational resource that can be available is the National Institute for Environmental Health Sciences. They have a unique worker trainer worker training program and they support uh, uh, awardees from around the country uh, who have a lot of experience in environmental work and they've actually received uh, lots of money for COVID training and COVID support to uh, healthcare and lots of other organizations. And so this uh, URL will get you an introduction to this uh, to this grant, this training grant program that's been around about 30 years and their, uh, their uh, uh, awardees have tremendous experience in the use of elast elastomeric respirators and other personal protective gear doing decontamination and setting up programs. And they've been doing this for more than 30 years. So I'd urge you to go to them and, and look for help from them. So 
with that, I think we're going to look forward to taking your questions and thank you very much. And thanks to all of our presenters that were a great job.